Child of the Water by Robert E. Waters Two boys sat in the flow of frigid water, neither willing to move, to give the other the satisfaction of knowing he had been bested. They were young, they were warriors. Well, not yet. But some day they would be, and neither harsh mountain rock nor freezing water would keep them from their destiny. Captain Victorio, tomorrow's Win Nanton, squadron commander of the Devil Dancers, third sole fighter wing, was proud of them. I saw you move, Deer Killer said, his skinny body shivering as the river water flowed around him. Around his neck, a small piece of deer antler bounced just above the waterline on a strand of leather cord. The day was hot, but the water seemed incapable of accepting the sun's gifts. Captain, sir, I saw him move. Liar, little boy said. He had indeed moved a finger, Victorio had noticed, but the boy would never admit it. You moved, dear caller. You wiggled your nose. Gentlemen, Captain Victorio said from the bank, devil dancers work together to solve problems. When the gulos strike, do you think they will care about who moved a finger or who wiggled a nose? The gula will kill you where you sit and care neither for your fingers or your noses. Focus your minds and deal with the pain of the freezing water. That's what matters. The boys tried to focus. Little boy was younger than Deer Caller by a year. He had already tried this challenge once before when he thought no one was looking. But Victorio had noticed and had tracked the boy in silence to this very river three days ago and had watched him sit obediently in the stream, shaking at the incessant rush of cold water around him. It was against the rules of training, indeed, but Victorio let it go. It never hurt to do a little pre-planning, he reasoned. Little boy seemed good at that, good at anticipating situations and putting himself in a position to prevail. Let others call it cheating, Victorio had thought, as he had watched his novitiate endure the freezing cold. I call it smart. They sat for several minutes more, neither taking his eyes off the other. Little boy made faces of evil spirits, go to trolls and the gun clown. He spoke silly gibberish and made Deer Caller snicker. Captain, Deer Caller said, no longer containing his mirth. He pointed at his younger rival. He's making faces at me. Enough, Victorio said. Time's up. Out. They crawled to the bank and rolled out, letting the sun warm their frozen skin. Little boy shivered and rubbed his arms. Ha! I knew it, Deer Caller said, pointing with a shaking hand. I knew you were cold. Admit it. Come, Victorio said. Let us continue. They stood and huddled around their captain. From a pouch tied to his waist, Victorio pulled two small tubes of water and handed them over. Uncork these and pour the water into your mouths. Hold it there, but do not drink. They did as directed, then handed the tubes back. Victoria tucked them away and said, Now, he pointed to the east, you will run to the top of that hill, taking the path I have shown you. It will be a long and difficult run, but a warrior would not drink the water, no matter how thirsty he is. A warrior knows how to control his body and his urges. He pulled the boys close and squeezed their hands. This is not a competition to see who will get there first. You must both get there with the water intact. Do you understand? He waited until both boys nodded agreement, then said, Now go. Little boy moved first, getting the jump on deer collar. The older boy's eyes glared in protest, but the younger was gone. Victorio followed closely behind, keeping pace as best he could. This would be an interesting run, he knew. As stated, the goal was not to be the winner, but he couldn't help but wonder who would actually reach the summit first. Deer Caller was the fastest by far, but Little Boy was the smartest, no doubt about that. The way grew steeper as the flatter terrain of the river valley gave way to harsh rock, twisted brush, and sharp cactus. Little Boy pushed hard, his body washed in sweat. The water, now clearly warm in his mouth, was making it hard to breathe. He must be terribly thirsty, his throat dry. Perhaps he'll take a sip, Victoria thought, as he jogged beside them and observed. Who would miss one little drop? Then Deer Caller was beside Little Boy, pumping his strong legs and taking the lead. The other boy's face was brilliant with joy. His thin lips were pulled back in a big grin, but not a drop of water escaped them. Little Boy shook his head, clearly trying to figure out how he had let such a lead evaporate. He doubled his efforts, pushed, pushing into Deer Caller and jumping over dead wood. Deer Caller stumbled and fell back again trying to keep his footing. He yelled something indiscernible, not wanting to open his mouth to lose the water. Little boy ignored the words, smiled triumphantly, and kept moving. 
The summit was near. With 30 paces left, Deercaller took the lead again and kept it. Vittorio could see the anger and disappointment on little boy's face. He had lost another race to Deercaller. Victoria watched Deercaller stumble forward, gasping for air. He clasped little boy on the back. Well, little boy, looks like you've lost again. But don't be too upset. You can't win them all, he chuckled. You can't win any of them, looks like. In the midst of Deercaller's cackle, little boy stood straight, smiled, winked, then bent over and spit his water onto the bleached rock so the captain could see. Want to bet? Deercaller's face flushed with panic. He fished around in his mouth with his tongue. His head dropped. His shoulders slumped. The water was gone. He had sipped too much. Part 2 <clears throat> Little boy edged his radiant fighter into raven pattern. His left wing was four degrees out of sync. Kaji Mokchacho! Captain Vittoria's voice boomed over the calm, commanding. A chill spread down Little Boy's spine at the sound of his full name. It reminded him of his mother. Sir, keep formation. This is not a drill. Yes, sir. He was the third in a five-fighter formation, moving rapidly toward a line of cometary knots in the helix nebula known as the necklace. Deer Caller flew at point, and Little Boy fumed. What's four degrees, he wondered, as he slowly shifted his fighter into the correct position. Deer Caller was twenty degrees too far forward just a moment ago and the captain didn't chew him out. <clears throat> but Captain Victorio never seemed obliged to explain his <clears throat> oft-times erratic and inconsistent command style. Erratic in little boy's mind, anyway. Then again, what did he know about command? He wasn't a devil dancer. Not yet, anyway. The brilliant white cusp of the cometary knot came into view, and little boy instinctively flicked on his fighter's radiation shield as a precaution to the harsh environment. The Gulo had thought it clever to run their heavy cargo hulls along the necklace as a way to screen out Union attacks, and it had worked for a while, but a crease in the line had been breached, and the fleet was determined to exploit the opportunity. It was a perfect way to get in real practical flight and fight training at low physical risk, and Little Boy was flying third. I should be in front, he thought, as he shifted left on cue with everyone else. I should be the clown. Keep tight, the captain said coordinating the effort from position two. Get, we get in and out quickly. Spray the platform and fly. No funny business. No delay. Ahagahi! The war, cry the war cry repeated through the squadron. Little boy checked his sensors and flipped on laser and missile arrays. I'm ready. His scanner pulsed with enemy blips. Fighter craft were converging on their location. Sir, three wasps are. I see them, Victoria said. Let them come to you. It's a screening force. Nothing to worry about. Maintain formation. Lock targets. And wait. Little boy did as directed. Hey, dear caller, he said over secure comm. Watch this. He waited. Waited until the wasps were in optimal range. On his dashboard, their weapons flashed active, and little boy threw his weight to the right as he leaned into the stick. He touched his dash, maintaining formation, but barrel rolling such that his laser array was at a proper firing angle. He fired, and the wasp close to him swerved and roiled off course, striking the next one to it and breaking the formation. The wasp reacted by laying on their flechette guns, but Lieutenant Redmoon, a veteran holding position five, ended the flurry with a carefully placed rocket into the lead wasp. It burst into a thousand tiny bits, causing collateral damage to the one next to it, forcing the third and final to break. Deer caller snickered through calm. Shut up, little boy said. I broke up their formation, at least. Stay focused, Victoria said, interrupting. Here we go. They burst into the necklace. The light from the helix star lit the dust in the brilliant white, red, and green. Little boy had never seen anything so beautiful, as if and if time were convenient, he'd like to just drift alone and quiet, soaking it all in. There was a peacefulness in space that one could not acquire planet side. That was one of the reasons he had wanted to be a devil dancer. He wanted to be one with the cosmos, to be a gan dancer, to dance around a bonfire until exhaustion and dehydration gave him the visions he needed to succeed, not only as a human being, but as an Apache, but as a pilot as well. That's how the senior members of the squadron gained their courage, and he was working toward that goal. All he had to do was show himself on this mission, <clears throat> show his talent, his genius, 
and he would be accepted. There was nothing he wanted more. They cleared the knot and before them, in a small, dustless corridor within the necklace, lay the Gulo carrier platform, open-faced and about five kilometers long, stretching further than little boy's eyes could see, but not too far for his senses. It was also about a half kilometer wide, wide and long enough for several cargo ships to set down, unload, and launch once more. He re-engaged his weapons and shifted left to the fo with the formation. Now the surface of the platform was visible. Every detail, every scratchy gulo symbol and diagram. There was also a blue shimmering dome above it. Sir, he said, will our weapons penetrate that shield? Yes, Victorio said. It's for radiation only, but we'll need to fly through it to get a good strafe. It's going to get a little bumpy. Be ready. Little boy noticed something else in the platform. He was about to mention it when Deer Caller chimed in. Sir, aren't those green hatch markings missile designations? Victorio grunted. ISR has fucked up once again, gents. This is going to be bumpier than I thought. Okay, increase speed by 20%, and let's reform to Sparrow. Damn you, Deer Caller. I saw it too. It was my turn to impress. Sparrow uh, was a tight formation, with a potential clown flying point. Deer Caller maintained that position, and Little Boy obeyed the order and pulled his radiant in until they were flying nearly wing to wing. It didn't make sense to him at first, and then he saw the logic of it. A smaller, tighter formation made for an even smaller moving target, and one that could fly past each battery faster and thereby confuse Gulo tracking. The captain was right. Flying through the shield made his dashboard flicker, and for a moment Little Boy thought his entire cockpit would be good, would go dead. Then it revved up again, and he lay hard in the stick to keep in line, then settled in once the formation had pierced the blue haze. Fire! Blue Boy lay on his stick, digging his fingernails into the trigger as if doing so would make them harder, fire harder, faster. First, laser fire. Five lines of green, cutting light tore into the Gulo formation, ripping huge chasms into its floor. Then they emptied their missile tubes. Each high-explosive round struck the platform, some penetrating deep into their mark, igniting fuel and ammunition reserves. Damaged pieces floated everywhere. Gulo batteries tried responding, and a few shells went forth and found targets. But radiants were too fast, too small a target, and by the time the Gulo batteries locked on heat signatures, the entire formation was well past the danger zone. But Little Boy saw it, and this time, he was the only one who, had, who did. While the others were cheering and glorifying in a successful strafe, including the captain, Little Boy saw a long, powerful prow cannon arching up at the end of the platform, faster than any barrel its side should move. The gun wasn't a small craft weapon, no. It was designed for larger hulls, destroyers, cruisers, capital ships. But it hit the squadron. He didn't waste time thinking. He gunned reverse thrusters and drove his fighter into Lieutenant Red Moon's. Red Moon fell uh, left at the impact, hitting the captains and forcing him into shines like the sun's position four. This chain reaction calls all four ships to full port. Only the lead fighter, Deer Callers, kept moving forward, unaware of what was happening behind him. The prow captain disregarded the flying, uh, the fighters falling away, locked itself on deer color, and fired. Brilliant white light flashed before little boy's eyes, and deer collar was gone. Part 3 Victorio didn't give little boy time to clear his cockpit. He bounded up the fighter's lowered wing, grabbed the boy by the scruff, and hoisted him out of the cockpit. He pulled the boy down the wing, tore off his helmet, and let the boy's bare brown novitiate war cap fall to the tarmac. Why did you break formation? Victoria screamed little boy into little boy's face. Why? Little boy did not speak, his eyes wild, fearful, glued to Victoria's face. I, I, dear caller is dead, incinerated. His soul will never greet use and life giver to follow the gone into the mountain. He will never dance. I know that, little boy shouted and then lowered his eyes again, realizing that his voice was too harsh, too confrontational. I did it to save you, to save Lieutenant Redmoon and Lieutenant Shines. Little boy described the cannon and its uncharacteristic speed. Victoria stood there, listening to every word, 
letting his angry breathing subside, his heart slow. He released the little boy and stepped back. Kaje, do you know why the back four in a raven or sparrow formation must maintain tight control over their position? Little boy nodded. Yes, sir. So that when and if the captain of the formation orders the fifth and lead fire, the clown, to assume his or her role, the back four can maintain a tight and orderly force against any attempt to destroy the clan, the clown, upon its leaving the formation. Without that tight control, weapons targeting can be hampered, slowed, so that the clown is vulnerable. And what is the key word or phrase of that rule? The little boy considered. To maintain the formation to protect the clown on his or her departure. No. Victoria snapped. The key word is captain. It's the captain that will make the decision. The captain did not order a break in the formation, did he? Because the novitiate did not radio his captain and warn him of the threat. With respect, sir, I made the judgment that there was no time to radio such concern. The cannon was tracking too fast, sir, for such communication. And you are qualified to make that decision on your own? I... Little boy paused, gnashed his teeth... Vittorio could see him trying to find the right words to say, the right response to end this confrontation. Yes, sir, I am. I was the only one who could. Vittorio sighed, rubbed his aching eyes. A headache was coming on. Go, he said, motioning behind him to the exit leading to crew quarters. Clean up and get ready for mess. There will be a debriefing at 0800. The little boy straightened, saluted, but Vittorio could see the boy's hand shaking as he held it to his forehead. Victoria saluted, then stepped aside to allow the boy to leave. Victoria leaned over the radiant wing and watched the little boy disappear through the exit. At his feet lay the brown novitiate war cap. He picked it up and looked at it, bare, nondescript, bereft of medals, service ribbons. But of course it would be. The little boy had not done anything yet to warrant medals or ribbons. Or had he? God damn it! Victoria hissed the words and threw the war cap down, as he saw Deer Killer's terrified face in his mind. God damn it all. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.